Hello, it's Fred Dynage. Thank you very much indeed for joining me. Remember, I'm talking to you about crime and criminals, gangsters and real baddies. I want to talk to you today about a guy called Wilf Pine. Wilf who, I can hear you say, but you shouldn't be because Wilf was one of the most influential gangsters there's ever been. Except, I'm not sure he actually was a gangster. You see, the extraordinary thing was, every single top gangster in London knew Wilf Pine, respected him, liked him, in some cases loved him, and in some cases also feared him. He was also much admired by the American Mafia. They feared him as well at times. But the extraordinary thing is, Wilf Pine never ever went to prison, not for one single day. Wilf was an enigma. Let me quote to you from this rather splendid book written by John Pearson, the guy who wrote the first crazed book and for my money the best one. It's called One of the Family, the Englishman and the Mafia. And that was Wilf Pine. And you see, he found Wilf an enigma as well. Can I quote to you from the book? When I saw Wilf Pine standing among the principal mourners at Charlie Cray's funeral, I sensed at once that he was different from the others. It was odd enough seeing all those top London criminals gathered together on that blustery April morning in the bright, hymn-happy interior of St Matthew's Church, Bethnal Green. All the old aristocracy of crime was on parade. Even Charlie Richardson was present, looking as usual like an elderly law professor, despite his 25-year stretch awarded at the so-called Old Bailey torture trial in the mid-1960s. So too was Mad Frankie Fraser, the only man alive to have been flogged twice with a cat of nine tails, who now makes a living from Rotarian lunches where he entertains his listeners by telling them how he extracted his victims' teeth with golden pliers. And beside him stood the Cray's old friend, the impassive Freddy Foreman, who got a 12-year sentence for disposing of the body of Jack the Hat McVitie on their behalf, and later confessed on primetime television to having helped another murder, Frank Mitchell, the Mad Axeman, for them as a favour. As these ageing villains took their places near Charlie's beautifully polished coffin, it was obvious to me that each and every one of them was regarding Wilf with a certain wary respect. What wasn't so obvious was why, and I left the funeral without discovering the answer. As I say, Wilf Pine, a complete enigma, very close friend of the Cray twins, Reggie and Ronnie, and also of their older brother, Charlie, but known to all of the London gangsters, a most amazing fellow. Born in Newcastle in the northeast of England, he had a terrible childhood early on, with a father who kept beating him. His mother finally left and went to live at Ryde on the Isle of Wight, and that's where Wilf finished up. When he left school, he became a dustman, and he was happy enough doing that. He was also a big, powerful, imposing sort of bloke, with tattoos on each of his fingers. He also became a doorman at some of the Isle of Wight's nightclubs. And then he began experimenting. He began, began bringing down groups, or as they call them now, battens from London to various venues on the Isle of Wight. And he was very successful at doing this. So much so, he caught the eye of a chap called Don Arden, who was one of the great London impresarios. He invited Wilf up to London, I think to act probably as an enforcer to start with, because Wilf was the kind of man, if, if you owed someone some money and Wilf turned up on the doorstep, you tend to pay the money straight away. So I think Don Arden first of all employed him as a kind of enforcer, but then realised that he had great managerial ability, and he then started getting him to manage some of his pop groups. One of the first groups he managed was called Black Sabbath. <laughs> with Ossie Osborne, and he was very, very good at that, was Wilf. He even had his own office for a time in Mayfair. When I first met him in 1966, he was managing a group then from Gosport, and they had a very successful record called Kites. They were called Simon Dupre and the Big Sound. Wilf, in fact, managed a number of very successful pop groups, and in that branch of his work, he frequently went to America. 
that is where he first encountered a guy called Joe Pagano, who was the head man, the capo, the godfather of the Genovese crime family. A very powerful and very, very dangerous man indeed. He kind of took Wilf under his wing. He liked him, and in fact he became what Wilf said later was a second father, or indeed perhaps the only father I ever had. Joe Pagano, in fact, was the best man at Wilf's marriage. That's how close they were. But again, despite his years in America, there were no convictions. Came back to England, again, no convictions. A total enigma was Wilf Pine. He really was well-connected. He was at the funeral of Reggie Cray. He was there when Reggie died in that hotel in Norwich, where he would be put, suffering from, from terminal cancer. Wilf was there. Wilf was there when Ronnie Cray had his heart attack at Broadmoor. Wilf was there when Charlie Cray actually died as well. So Wilf was always there, the most connected man in the business. But was he a gangster? John Pearson never found out. I never really found out, even though we were very, very close friends. And I'll talk to you next time about that friendship. And incidentally, if you've got any questions you want to ask about any of the gangsters I've encountered, please drop me a line there, and I'll do my best to give you the answer. Next week, we'll talk more about the enigma that was Wolf Pine.